you don't necessarily think about the risks or the inherent risks associated with flying. And then I was off. Like, you know, I did, I did, you know, I walked the walk, I went out there. You don't start some and then you're never going to get it bloody finished. You know, there are inherent risks associated and attached with those pursuits. And in a nutshell, um, yeah, um, uh, you know, they, they can be incidents or malfunctions and, it, it, and things can happen and you've got to deal with that. Yeah, so I've been um, procrastinating, mate, about... No, procrastinate isn't the right word. I've just been putting off doing the audio book. And I get... Oh, I say book. I mean, I've got six books out now. Um, and I... You know, I'm not... I, I'd never want someone else to read my book. I, and, I don't, and I don't think the reader would... I think they want Chris Frawl to read his own memoirs, right? As such, Jamie, I've... I've just been put this with YouTube. There's always stuff to do. Um, so I've been put, I've been putting it off, but obviously, as you can see, I've got all the equipment to sit here and do it. I know, I know what software you need. I know the there's a little plugin you can get for audacity friends at home. Audacity is a, a software suite. It's free. It's really good for recording audio. You, you download a plugin for it. And it tells you if your audio quality is good enough to go on Amazon Audible, for example. Sure. And if it's not, um, there's like five five uh, compressors you can put it through, and it tweaks with the levels. And then it goes, "Yep, yeah, it gives it literally like gives you a thumbs up." But because I don't really plan a diary, which I should, I come to this computer every day. There's a, there's I get about 500 emails a week and I'm always trying to get at least you know, one video out a day to keep the whole YouTube algorithm thing going. And what I'm trying to say, Jamie, is I've put it off. I'm also a wee bit daunted, I guess, because I'm under no delusion that sitting here doing an audio book could, well, A, it's, it's not a short process. It's not. But B, it could end up bloody tedious. But yeah, you're saying they sit you down and go, go through it with you and record it in a one They do it in a one And like, um, you know, realistically, you know, you can't go say, I mean, my book was about 90,000 words, you know, like life on a thread, uh, the narrative. And, and it's probably, I don't know, 20 plus chapters and, and so, yeah, they start it and I did it on, let's say I did it on a Monday to Wednesday, three days full time. It was about 10 hours a day, more or less. You, know, you break for a bit of lunch, granted, and a couple of tea breaks here and there. But it is proper graft. I mean, um, and then, of course, let's say you read a chapter. When you're going through the chapter live and you're doing it with a kind of a, a normal voice and you're talking to the microphone and you've got to emphasize words, sentences and Every now and again, you know, you, you, your throat gets a bit dry. That's normal when you're, you're, you're rabbiting and you're talking for a long time. So the audio engineer, the technician guy behind the glass, he will kind of stop you. He'll come in on the mic and say, got to stop you there. You've got to rewind a couple of sentences. He said, um, you've got a bit of a frog in your throat there. You take a sip. So you drink some tea, you drink some water. And, um, and then he kind of like, yeah, okay, that's good. And then you crack on again. And so occasionally you'll fluff because of uh, sort of natural drawbacks, like I've mentioned. Uh, your voice gets a bit, you know, you lose it a little bit or it gets a bit dry. Um, or indeed, you just fluff the sentences because, you know, your, your brain gets a bit tired, right? So you'll read, read, read. And when you're reading out loud, especially, I mean, I wasn't used to reading out loud for three days straight. So maybe some people are like maybe audio actors, you know, if they're doing it kind of, kind of professionally for a living. But I don't read out loud regularly in life. But so when you're doing it off the cuff for three days straight, yeah, you'll fluff sentences or words here and there. And again, the technician, he'll stop you there. He'll, he'll kind of ping you back and re-record the sentences that you need to go over. So, mate, it's proper graft. I'd say that to anybody. I mean, not to put you off, but it's a, it's a, it's a rewarding process when you, when you get it done. 
but it's a long haul and um, and yeah yeah i mean I, I was guided by this kind of audio technician guy and they work they're great they're they're consummate professionals and they work with a lot of uh, authors and probably been doing the job for years uh, but i mean i'm sat in a little studio it was freezing cold it was easter last year in 21 and you could barely swing a cat in this studio you know it was me just sat in a little sound booth with a plinth i'm on one of them sort of comfy sort of business chairs you know sort of fake leather things with a plinth with the with a with a sort of a digital book and i can kind of scroll through uh, to kind of carry carry on on the uh, the process of, of the read and then meanwhile it's all being recorded but you're 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 going back and you're doing reruns but yeah yeah it's, it's proper graft and you've got to really want to do that to, if you do, fair play to you. But it's, for you, Chris, it's time consuming. And obviously you're juggling, a few, you're spinning a few plates there, buddy. So you've got to figure out what you can take on, mate. Yes. I'm a great believer though, mate. If you don't start something, then you're never going to get it bloody finished, do you? For real, yeah. You've got to, you, you, you've definitely got to set a couple of, you know, a few dates aside to, to kind of make something happen in life. That's for sure. Did you... Uh, God, I'm going to ask you all the questions, but I think this is a great chat. Did you have to find your voice? Did you have to like try and adopt a voice or did, did they say, look, just be yourself? Yeah. I mean, mainly I was myself. I kind of just used my, my own, I guess, judgment on that because at the end of the day, you know, you've got to, you've got to own your own story, right? You've got to, you've got to be comfortable about it and you've just got to realize actually it's my book. It's my story. I'm the author. They want to hear it from me. They're not expecting an actor here. They really want to hear it from me, ideally. So yeah, I, I, I tried to just be myself and, and speak in the normal kind of tone, in the normal kind of everyday manner. But I've got to admit, when some of the chapters did, I think, require some emphasis and a bit of gusto, and I'm not an actor. I'm not a professionally trained actor, never, never have been. Um, although I've done a little bit of sort of method acting, you know, a long time ago when I was you know, more or less a, a very young man with with the BBC once upon a time. But that's another story. Um, and but I'd never really done much in 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 this kind of sense. And I, I figured that there was a couple of chapters that did need some emphasis. And I remember one in particular uh, for, the, for for your um, understanding. And it was a chapter that centred around um, the, uh, the the pea company process that I did many many years ago up in uh, Catterick in North Yorkshire. And I, and I was probably only about 27 years old at the time. And of course, anyone that's been through P Company, it's a bit like, you know, when you did your Marines course back in the day, you know, it's just nails, you know, you've been training for months in the build-up, you know, mentally, psychologically gearing yourself up for that process. So I talked in earnest about the process of P Company in, in my case, which is selection for the parachute regiment. And um, I kind of went through the, uh, the, the chapter which described the processes of, of P Company quite um, succinctly and in detail. And then particularly when it got to one of the final events, which was the milling. Yeah, so the, the toe-to-toe toe -to -toe in, the, in the mock sort of ring, you know, you've got the milling and you're standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with your opponent. And there's this tash, bristling British Army NCO who's like... Um, a referee in the middle and he's saying, right, are you ready? Are you ready? Stand by and mill. And I'm having to put the energy into the, uh, into the, into the chapter, you know, into the dialogue to, to give the reader an understanding of actually what's going on and to bring the chapter to life. So there were certainly many points in the narrative of my story where I tried to bring it to life to the best of my sort of judgment. Um, and, and I guess my, uh, my, my sort of reflections on that, looking back in, in terms of how it was, how it was to be there kind of in person. But um, I think if you don't do that and you're kind of just speaking in a monotone for, you know, 24 chapters all the way through, you know, it's probably not worth doing an audio book, quite honestly. You've got to try and, and bring it to life. So you just got to use, um, you know, a bit of a, sort of your own sort of savvy sort of wisdom on that uh, and that i think helps um and from what they said they said yeah, yeah we we think you did a great job given that you'd never done this before and, and i've had some pretty rip-roaring feedback on um 
on the audio sort of formats from Apple and, and Amazon. So I must have done something pretty reasonably uh, uh, well in the process. So, yeah, fingers, fingers crossed, mate, and that people are going to enjoy it. Oh, well, there's no doubt they'll enjoy it. Um, they'll enjoy it. God, I got a load, I could say, about re- listening to audio books as well. We'll come on to that. What about, um, I think maybe one of the things that's making me procrastinate is when I write, I really try to put the reader in the story in every sense. So I'm talking about sight, sound, smells, how I'm feeling. And I I always try to make it a bit jokey. So, God, bloody hell, I wasn't expecting that. You know, so the reader would, would, would be thinking the same thing in that part in the story. But one thing I do is, and some people will say, oh, you shouldn't do this. But I'm like, nah, you should. Is I use accents. So, I mean, I'm in Eat and Smoke. There's a, an IRA guy that I met and he's like, you've been in the military, the British military. And, and okay, yeah, as I'm saying it now, it's highlighting how difficult this is going to be. My approach is going to be not to try to be Mike freaking Yarwood. Uh-huh. everyone's going, who's Mike Yarwood? Mike Yarwood was a very famous British um, impersonator back in the 80s. He was incredible, really, really yeah. good. Um, and of course, they've, what's it got Rory Bremner and these types. I'm not going to try and be that, but I'm just going to put a slight... I mean, the Chinese themselves, people think I'm being patronising when I write the way that they speak, but I want people to know what I went through. Yeah, um, it brings it to life, Chris, you know. So anything you can do to try and tweak things. And, and the accents is an interesting one because they said to me for the audio book, I said about accents, you want me to try and attempt the accents? And I'm pretty good at it. No, not too bad. And they said, no, nah, it's probably better that you don't. And they said, you know, sometimes it can be, it can just, it can just lead to a little bit of confusion on the other end. I didn't necessarily agree with that, but I, I just went with the guidance. So I tried... I kind of spoke in a fairly neutral tongue regarding, you know, person A and B in the room. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I would agree that um, if you, if you feel you're pretty good at accents, yeah, why not give it a, give it a blast mm-hmm. and it, it, you know, probably be well received. Yeah. I think I'd have a little rehearsal bef- before I click, <laughs> click, click the record, just rehearse the line, the paragraph and then go. Yeah. What else have I been thinking about? Rehearsal is a great idea, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot you can do as well. I mean, when you can clip and paste in an audio program, that, that's obviously going to be a great a great help. I guess you'd, you'd, you'd get good at judging how long you pause when you speak. So when you clipped and cut it and pasted it back together, you'd get the... Yeah, I think from my tip would be where you see the sentences kind of structured and you see the, the, the grammar and the punctuation. So, you know, commas, full stops, like hyphens, that kind of thing. Sometimes it can be important to just read according to the grammar. So, you know, you, you'll make sure that when you get to a comma, maybe there's just a slight pause, just a, just a, just a, a very touch of a pause uh, to, to reflect that within the sentence. And when you get to a full stop there's a bit more of a pause before you kind of just take a breath and then start the next sentence. And then of course, when you get to perhaps the, you know, the end of the the chapter, again, there's a, there's a bit of a pause before you can go on to to the next chapter. So it's just um, acknowledging the, the, the grammar that that is um, laid out in front of you. I mean, it's been written with grammar for a reason and any, you know, any book that's been well-written, would have hopefully would have been proofread. And then if you read according to that um, uh, grammatic structure, if you will, you'll find you'll do a better job of the audio when it, when it um, you know, in terms of the, the recorded dialogue um, as you go through. It, it will pay off, mate, in that respect. Yeah, I have heard that some people's process, and I've seen this written in articles, is what you can do is get your page up and get a pencil and just make little notes, say, on a comma where you you tend to sort of maybe like rush through it and you've got to remind yourself, no, this is a like a little bit more of a just just to mentally remind you, ah, this bit's coming up. And yeah, ordinarily I'd say it like this, but it it, it trips me up. 
Yeah, absolutely. Or you might want to perhaps underscore with a red pen or whatever if a certain sentence needs a bit more emphasis or, or you need a bit more volume in your voice, you know, when you talk through a certain sentence. It's stuff like that, you know, but definitely pauses, they work always really well. It's the same when you're doing speaking. So I do a fair bit of um, public speaking. And when you're stood in front of an audience, the use of pauses can be exceptionally good when you're trying to get your points across, you know, before you go on and, and, um, and, and, um, and switch to, you know, part B of, of, of that particular topic that you're talking about. So, you know, you can use that. It's almost like using grammar in speech, um, just integrating pauses and, and emphasis on, on the volume of your voice and, and stuff like that. There's little tricks, but ultimately you want to be able to communicate clearly whether you're speaking and indeed, you know, if it's the same for, you know, trying to produce um, something in the audio book sense, it's the same kind of, same kind of uh, concept, really. How, how's the response been? Because what you get a lot, I, I get it a lot. Chris, when, when are you going to do the audio book? And it makes, makes you kind of feel like, wow, they're going to fly off the shelf. <laughs> yeah. But do you, do you have an idea of the ratio of paperback or pa- traditional book to audio that you sell? I think, um, yeah, I mean, most people go for the, the, the actual, or the, initially they went for the hardback, and of course, you know, the, no doubt the paperback will, will hopefully do well, uh, because p- it's, people are less sentimental probably about paperback. It's the kind of thing that they feel, well, they don't, they're not necessarily buying it as a mantelpiece um, sort of figure. Uh, they can have a, have a paperback book. They can you know, not feel so sentimental. They can read it. They can pass it on to their mates. You know, friends and family, you know, or just chuck it into the local charity shop or whatever. You know, once they've read a read a paperback, it's maybe unlikely that they're going to go back again. And um, I think the hardback had a bit more sen- sentimental value for most people. So maybe people are reluctant to buy it. They'll wait for the paperback in that sense because not yeah. everybody wants to collect, you know, five hundred books on on a big bookshelf in in their home as they go through life in this day and age. You know, we live in a much more perhaps minimalist world. We buy stuff, we utilize it, we pass it on, or indeed we dispose of it. And um, I, I think you asked about ratio. I'd say probably, I, I know I did sell, you know, sort of several thousand copies of hardback um, last year. Um, and I think probably about 50% of what I did in hardback, I, I sold in the audio sense, so audio book format. And probably maybe another fifty percent, you know, of the, the hardback um, numbers probably were in the ebook as well. So that's like the Kindle electronic version. If you just want to uh, effectively download it onto your um, your Kindle device or your your um, uh, what are they you know the iPad or, or indeed your phone uh, to read it as and when you could be on the tube or the bus or you know uh, you know trying to get from A to B, trying to get to work that kind of stuff, you, got, you get a chance to read the electronic version. Or indeed, you can, you know, plug your phones in and listen to the audio version. So, yeah, lots of options with, all, with books in general these days. Yeah, I find with audio books, if I'm in the car driving, this is a really great place to listen to them because I'm not distracted. Well, you probably should be distracted in a car, but, but I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm really listening. I mean, I listen to Stephen King's On Writing when I was yeah. writing my first memoir and I loved it. I'd be listening to it and then going home and practicing what I'd learned by listening. He's a great author. I've, I've done a couple of his audio books as well. And um, yeah, really, uh, they really get you going, you know, and it's, it's a real escapism to, to get into one of Stephen King's books. Definitely. What I found though, Jamie, is if, if say I try to listen to one when I'm in bed at night, the fact that at some point listening to it, you're going to drift off to sleep, that process in itself kind of erases my memory from what I've just listened to. So I wake up, I wake up in the morning and think, where the hell was I? I cannot remember. I mean, you can set a timer on, yeah. or, you know, go to sleep after 30 minutes. And that's, <laughs> that's the yeah. book folks, not me. And, uh, and it will stop playing, but, or, if I'm in the garage doing some, I've uh, been make, making a knife recently and I've been listening to 
Craig Harrison's um, book about his sniper career. And I, the way my mind is, uh, my mind's on overdrive all the time anyway. I'm always thinking about stuff. That's why I need to meditate more. <laughs> and I can suddenly stop and realize I just haven't listened to that for half an hour. It's been playing and I haven't listened to a word. Can't even remember what. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. You just sort of switch off mentally and you kind of, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm guessing you're probably similar in character and you, you kind of get a bit frustrated with yourself, almost pissed off internally because you think, hang on, I wasn't switched on there and I wasn't quite taking that in and absorbing that, that narrative properly. And you've got to take it back. I'm like that sometimes when I watch um, something on, on Netflix or whatever. And I've got to take it back because I didn't quite uh, catch it all because mainly because my mind was drifting and perhaps I'm thinking about something else. The problem- but I really wanted to watch it, so I'll run it back. Maybe that's an element of me being a natural sort of perfectionist. I'm not happy if I don't absorb it in the way that I should be absorbing it. The thing is, is two different processes, listening to a book and reading one. Because reading one for a start, you're, it's visual, so it's going into your brain visually. So you're actually imprinting those words into your subconscious. And when you get to a bit in a book, you think, hang on, I'm, I, just, I don't really remember what I read there, my mind drift. You just go back a page and go, ah, yeah, 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 I was there. Whereas in an audio book, you're like, oh, I'm just completely lost now. Well, was it half an hour ago I stopped focusing or was it 15 minutes? And then you've got to get your device and thumb through it to get back to where you were. And then you listen to it and then a 20 minute chunk and you're like, Oh no, I listened to that bit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different process. Yeah. You've just got to, especially if it's something that you're into and you, you know, you really want to follow it. That does take some concentration in itself and trying to keep up that kind of, that cognitive sort of buoyancy, you know, mentally and, and trying to keep the mind lifted in order to, to go through the, 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 the narrative and absorb it all mentally. That does take some work. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, you've got to kind of embrace it. I, I um, give you an example. I read a really interesting one a few months ago, but boy, it was heavy. I mean, to give you an idea, this guy, I kid you not, I think he took... I think he took six years to write it. So it was a massive research project. And it was, um, it was the hist- basically it was the history of, of nuclear, sort of nuclear, all things nuclear, nuclear um, warfare. And I'm struggling to remember the actual author's name. Um, but it was the, um, but if I remember rightly, the, the, the guy that read it, because it, it wasn't the author that read it, it was a gentleman called Scott Brick, I think, from memory. And it was available on, on like Amazon Audio, but it was pretty much the history of nuclear. And it was a tremendous history of all things kind of nuclear, you know, that nuclear sort of race, the Cold War, the sort of nuclear development when they sort of split the atom or the early kind of um, testing and so on and so forth. And then the latter day kind of um, s- summary of, of the history and what we should really be alarmed about was, was really quite shocking. And, and it covered Chernobyl, it covered the, the modern day kind of risks associated with more countries getting their, their hands on nuclear and, and the technology and, and the weaponry and all the rest of it. Is it called Bo- Bomb Scare? The history, no, it wasn't. Of, the um, history and future of nuclear weapons? It wasn't that, no, but it was, um, it was, there was, a, there was an, on the cover, it was just a, a simple um, like animated picture of one man about to press the red button. So it's just a hand hovering over the red button, which I thought was genius because that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's the biggest risk. That's what we're all scared of, you know. So, um, and it's kind of what drove, you know, the the kind of fear behind the Cold War, and even now with what's going on, you know, it's what uh, is kind of what is the underlying sort of fear with all of us in the West. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, um, I'm really struggling with this one, mate, to remember what it was, but um, it was on Amazon audio. Um, yeah. yeah it, I was, it'll come um, to me. We'll, we'll, we'll dig it out, mate. We'll dig it out. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I should do. Right. Hang on. Let me. 
I'm going to get your book up. Yeah, cool. Lot life uh, on a thread. Yeah, I'm getting your book up. I'm gonna I'm gonna read from it. Okay, <clears throat> go for I, it, mate. I, I'm gonna pretend that I'm doing your. You're audio. the author. Yeah, Chris I'm Straw do- is Jamie Hart. <laughs> Yes. audio actor <laughs> extraordinaire yes. hey i've got my first proper acting role coming up i'll talk to you about that in a second let me get let me read this so and this friends i'm not reading this to show off my skills i'm sh- i'm reading this to show you how difficult this is going to be um obviously i haven't uh, i'm not as familiar with jamie's book as i am my own but so 19th of august 2007 Groundhog Day, number 19. I pulled back the curtains and there was the bright blue sky. A few puffballs of white cloud, the other green tree tops, complete, <laughs> creep, tree tops. <laughs> completely still. Simpsons weather. Simpsons weather, the aviators call it. And that's when you get day after day out there. The rain will sweep through in the afternoon water the plants, clear the air, then head on inland and head back and hand back the blue sky. But this is how it starts every morning. Leighton buzzard, it is not. It's why I'd chosen to get my pilot's license in Florida. Back home, you could spend a whole month in flight school waiting for the rain to lift. And I only had a month to play with, kill some time usefully. Then the serious business was to begin. At last, a chance to do my bit for queen and country. Seven years with the military, all that technical training, all that lung-bursting effort, and I had to make it into one of the best military units in the world. Oh. So, Jamie, not only am I exhausted just reading that little bit, but I'm also, as I'm reading it, it's not flowing to me. I'm just reading. I'm just trying to do a good job. And I'm realizing it's not flowing in my ears. I wonder what it's like for the, for the listener. How how did that sound? Yeah, not bad. I mean, obviously you don't don't know the narrative. So if you'd read it perhaps, uh, you know, uh, more recently and you were kind of more familiar with it, therefore from a recent sort of standpoint in your mind, you'd probably be a bit more confident I, th- I think that if, again, because it's not your, it's not your kind of, you're not the author, so to speak, it's hard to just go straight into it and read something like that. It's much easier when you're, when you're the author and you know kind of what's coming. So probably your confidence was slightly lacking as a reader. Um, and again, if you're not used to doing that day in, day out as a professional, that is hard graft, mate. It is hard graft. So I think you did a pretty good job, but trust me, it's, it is it is hard work. Um, yeah, I think you've definitely... There's guys that do that for a living, Chris, and that's all they do Monday to Friday, you know, and they get paid for it, you know, and um, and so there's a, there's a difference, buddy, when you're doing it, when you're living and breathing um, sort of audio in that sense. Well, I've just literally bought your audio book. I'm going to... Awesome, deli- mate. Well, well, listen, it's a, it's a cracker, like you said, if you're driving. So for people that are, like, you know, busy professionals say out there on the road you know you know you know van drivers or delivery or uh, maybe truckers you can really kind of get immersed in that and um, there's a good sort of about you know 11 12 hours of playback so you can sort of take your time with it and absorb it all and hopefully get to get something out of it um, when you're out and about mm. hey it brings us on nicely to talk about something that i found utterly fascinating and yet I haven't really had much chance to talk about it with a fellow pilot. And that is learning to fly. So, sure. so I got my pilot's license in Florida. I, I learned to fly in Florida as well. Um, my story is quite simple. I'm always, if there's something I want to do, Jamie, I never say that I'm never going to do it. You know, I'm not one of these people, oh, I'll never do that. I'm like, yeah, I'll probably... I really want to do it. Let's stow it away in on, on the back burner in my mind. And because I've always done that, everything that I've ever wanted to do has pretty much come, come good now. Um, 
few things that are still on the back burner would be skiing to the South Pole, climbing Everest, rowing across the Atlantic. But so I used to look up at aeroplanes and think, God, I wonder what it must be like to fly one of those. And that's kind of where it started. And then I met a girl. Um, we did our first skydive together in New Zealand. And she said, oh, I'm a pilot. I'm like, what? And I'm just all ears then. I, 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 this sort of thing fascinates me. If I was to say that to my mates or mates that I've had, I should say, <laughs> they'd just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Who's trying to get the beer? You know, just not, in, not interested in. But for me, the fact she said she was a pilot was fascinating. And I'm like, tell me, I want to know all about, about it. And she was explaining the radio procedure and all this kind of stuff that she learned to fly in the UK and it took three years or something. So one time I had, um, I was at uni and you get really long summer holidays at uni, don't you? So I did a whole load on that holiday. Actually, I, I, I did, I got my pilot license, skydiving license, um, flew down to Central America to visit uh, places I hadn't been, which I think was at El Salvador, actually. And then I met up with a friend and we flew to Cuba. Then I flew down to South America and I got all these tiny little planes to visit all the countries I hadn't been. So it was Colombia, Venezuela, Suriname, French, French Guiana. Um, and uh, yeah, I, what I'm trying to say is I did an awful lot on one holiday, but I digress. Sorry. That's cool. It's interesting. You've done a lot of travel. That's for sure. Yeah, I am. I've done it to the point where I, I can sit back now and I don't have, you know, I don't, I, I can feel really, just great about it all but what i did jamie is i got i went to the local shop and i bought a flying magazine and then i just looked through the back of it thinking right how about i go to south africa i've heard it's cheaper there and they get good weather and i just settled upon an advert that said learn to fly in three weeks and i'm not sure if there was a price there but the price effectively was about 2,700 pounds and it said call this number in England so I called it and a chap said oh yeah what it is I work on behalf of a a flight school called Trade Winds in Florida basically I put business this guy's way and he lets me go and fly for free in my summers so next thing you know I'm flying to Miami and he came to pick me up at the airport um, or Orlando or somewhere it was. And yeah, that was it. That's how I, I started. And, and as you, as you said, and your book made clear, then I think it was the fact that you can do it in such a condensed period of time. So that's how I got onto it. How, how about you? Yeah, it was similar. It was similar for me. So I, um, I was, I'm, I'm very much of a similar mindset in terms of, I'm not one of these guys that are going to be just down the pub sort of, talking the talk i'm more the, more of a guy that will walk the walk so if i come up with an idea and an ambition and i really set on that i mean realistically you're not going to do everything in life but if i've got an ambition that um, i'm really passionate about i want to fulfill that i want to go and walk the walk so i i, I remember choosing florida as well because of the uh, relative proximity i mean it's only a flight across the atlantic the, the much better um, chance or window of better meteorological conditions or weather and the, and the chance for, you know, for the sunnier days and, and therefore to get the process done within a relatively short time frame. So I'd given myself probably, I don't know, it was like five, six weeks max uh, over one summer. So that was August, um, so around about July, August, 2007. And um, the first thing obviously going to the States was to get my visa. And I went to the U S embassy in London persuaded them that I wasn't a massive threat because this was post 9-11. Obviously, they were, they were quite cautious about who they would admit to, indeed, to learn to fly. 
in, in US airspace. And so once I'd been through the interviews at the embassy, got the visa, um, and then I was off. And like, you know, I did, I did, you know, I, I walked the walk, I went out there. Um, and I, similarly, I got, I got picked up, you know, I got taken out to the flight school or maybe it was the accommodation first night. It just went from there. And it was a day-by-day kind of comprehensive process, um, full-time. And then, you know, um, and I was many weeks into, into the course in, in, in my case. Yeah. It, it, were you excited to go out there? Yeah, I was. It was an ambition that kind of harked back to uh, childhood for me, really. I mean, I was inspired by my late grandfather who did a bit and um, he often used to talk about aviation and aircraft and he was a real kind of aviation nut, frankly. I mean, he would draw them and he would be kind of working out all the mathematical kind of equations to do with, you know, um, sort of airspeed, maximum climb rates, um, sort of velocities, because he went on to become, a after the war, after World War II, he went on to become a British aerospace engineer. So his thing was all about um, aerodynamics of, of aircraft um, in, in the manufacturing stage. Uh, and also missiles. So he was very much looking at aerodynamics and, um, you know, all of the kind of the mathematics behind all of that. And and a long story short, he really, I, I kind of cottoned on to, you know, what granddad was all about when I was a kid. And that's where the inspiration perhaps came from, from a young age. He also took me to a few air shows, right? So places like the Duxford, you know, near Cambridge, and some of the some of the other big air shows around the country, I think it was Farnham, and and it was it was a tremendous, uh, um, you know, when I think back to my childhood memoirs, you know, I, I like you, I'd look, like you know be there looking to the skies on numerous occasions, thinking, oh wow, amazing, and perhaps one day I'd like to try that. And when I was a kid, things that stood out was like the media surrounding Concorde. Yeah. And then the supersonic sort of passenger jet going across the Atlantic. And I was fascinated and I would follow stories like that because the fact that these aircraft could break the, the speed of sound, not just once, but twice just blew my mind. And, you know, there's things like supersonic boom and I would study that and I would read into it all. So yeah, the, the fascination was there from, from a young age. Um, and in and things like, um, um, you've got things like the Imperial War Museum and there's the RAF Museum as well in London. As a kid, I was absolutely mesmerised and then I'd we'd be walking around that, those museums like hand in hand with my, my granddad and he'd be filling me in on the details about these aircraft, quoting like <laughs> perhaps, uh, you know, airspeed and again, climb rates and all the rest of it. So it was definitely there. And of course, fast forward, when I did, you know, put my money where my mouth was and, and actually venture out to Florida. Yeah, I was really excited about the process and, 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 what, and what it would entail. Um, and, and then, you know, getting actually to grips with the cockpit and having instructors sort of work by me and, and sort of monitor the progress. It was an exciting time. It really was. And um, you don't necessarily think about the risks or the inherent risks associated with flying perhaps in the similar vein, you mentioned skydiving and I've done a bit of that as well. And you don't necessarily think about the risks, but you know, there are inherent risks associated and attached with those pursuits. And in a nutshell, um, yeah. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they can be incidents or malfunctions and, and, and things can happen and you've got to deal with that. Yes. So just to put us in a picture, um, I just read from your book, didn't I? Was it 2007? Uh, well, the incident was 2007, yeah, to be, uh, for the record, 19th of August, 2007. Yeah. Me. So when you went to learn to fly was 2007. I, I was there 2005. I was in a place called Fort Pierce uh, and I yeah. skyd- skydived in Sebastian. Um, Florida, obviously, East Coast. Um, yeah. Very nice weather, but you got these massive heads of cloud in the afternoons that yeah. Built and built and built, and it, you, you could it, you could literally fly around. I mean, you you didn't fly when 
in these yeah. conditions. But it's put, almost predictable, isn't it? The weather, the weather patterns, they're almost mm. very predictable every day. And which, which part of Florida were you? So, yeah, w- within the sort of uh, general kind of Orlando region, I think I was slightly to the north. Uh, but I know that I was still just underneath the federal airspace um, where I was working mm. because that was overhead. That, would be, that was higher than sort of uh, 1,200 feet. It kind of it started to then uh, broach into federal airspace for, for, for the Orlando. So the Orlando was the big federal airport. And I was just operating at a small kind of mu- what they call municipal airport or aerodrome. Where did you stay? Just locally, in a, like a local sort of um, quiet, sort of sleepy rural village setting. And literally, I lived in a bu- in a sort of a, a large bungalow with some other students. And uh, you know, it was a leafy kind of tree lined uh, streets. It backed onto like a plush little golf course in Florida, and it was all very kind of you know middle class kind of conservative area. Very lovely, really. Uh, just hot as hell in the summertime. You remember that kind of heat and humidity. Oh. So sticky. And literally, I remember walking in every morning and I'd sort of take a bit of a shortcut over the, the periphery of the golf course. And you'd hear this like thwack of the, 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 the sort of uh, the metal on golf ball when the guys were playing golf early in the morning. And then you'd hear like the moans and groans if the shot wasn't right or the jubilation, you know, and the hoops of, mm. of joy if they kind of hit a good shot. And then you hear a few birds twittering in the, in the trees and the sort of smell, you know, of the, the sort of uh, the wood and the pine in, in, the si- in, in the side of the golf course. So all these things kind of stuck out in my mind. It was very much tropical, and that is Florida. Um, but, yeah, really hot and humid, which has its advantages certainly for flying, definitely, because, you know, like I said earlier, you know, better, better weather conditions – much more chance of getting the flying done in a, a more comprehensive time frame. Um, so there's pro, there's, there's, but there's pros and cons because when, when the weather, when the storm sit fronts come in, it will absolutely lash down. And that really does um, not just put a dampener on this flying, but it actually cancels it out because there's no way some of those storm fronts, there's no way you're, you're getting up. And so you've got to be mindful of that. You've got to check weather. You've got to check radar frequently and the, the sort of Met reports that you can um, check the sort of daily uh, bulletins on the computer for uh, mm-hmm. at the flight school. But yeah, it was an exciting process, a lot going on, very absorbing process, but it's a very different environment out there to what it is in the UK. You know, we're very temperate and, and quite comfortable by comparison. And you've got to be geared up for, you know, life in the tropics, as it were. Yes, we, I started off in a, one like, one of these typical motels you see in the American movies had a aging swimming pool out the back. Uh-huh. And then at some point uh, about a week into that, we got offered a, a, an apartment by a friend that knew the instructor. And so I think there were three of us. We lived in this little apartment on, and it had a dock at the back on onto an inlet from the ocean. So every night we just drank American beer and fished off this inlet it was oh it was, it was great um but i didn't know what to expect i didn't have any preconceived ideas i kind of i pictured it must be like driving a car but in the sky and obviously it's not even anything like it um and i never thought of failure but when i did get there there was an austrian chap and he just failed his test so it wasn't really like a a nice intro, the fact that, oh, what, you can fail this? Ah, okay. And then, of course, the way our minds work, that plants a seed then, doesn't it? That, oh, I might fail. Ugh. But it, it didn't get me down or anything. I just was ter- determined not to fail. I very almost did, even before getting on the runway. Um, you know, you've got that. I don't know what it's called, but there's a line from the um, out on the pan where, the, where you, you, you wait and you contact ground control and you ask for clearance and then you give you clearance to go onto the runway. There's a line, isn't there? You don't go over that line. Yeah, sort of a runway threshold. Yeah. Yes. And I pulled up to it and I tell you what, my mind had blanked and I was just prepared to go straight over it. That would have been instant failure, I'm guessing. And as I did, 
I saw my instructor, who's a Swedish guy, I saw him flinch. And I, I just out the corner of my eye, I saw his leg go for the, the dual brake. Because you have, uh, I think we had dual controls in, in, in our plane. And as I saw it, I suddenly realized what I'd done and I beat him to it and I hit the brake. And he looked, looked at me and said, Do you know what that line is? And I said, Yeah, yeah. It's called the so and so line. He went, Are you allowed to go over? I said, No, no, of course not. I said, We got, we got to wait here now until we get clearance. And he's like, So I completely blagged it. <laughs> good, good shout. But uh, it was funny. My instructor was called Ernie. I took him a bottle of Johnny Walker and he went, oh, uh, it was like he'd never been given a gift before or something. And he looked really awkward. And then he, he stowed it in this locker in the flight office, <laughs> went, uh, yeah, my, I won't tell my wife about that. I, I have, I've had a bit of a problem. So obviously he was re- re- <laughs> recovering from al- an al- al- alcohol addiction. Um, but he'd take us up, and I have to say, Jamie, he was the worst instructor I think you ever could have to teach you anything. One of these people that, because he knows how to do it, he doesn't understand that you don't know this. And it was awful. We'd come in to do the landings, and I had, because I've got no background in aerodynamics, I didn't realize that you land on a cushion of air. That's the that's why birds almost tilt backwards as they as they come into land like a duck landing on a on a on a lake. You see the head go back, the wings flare, they slow in the end, and they just gently touch down and 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 they're fine. I was thinking it's like the Dukes of Hazard when you jump a car, that you 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 kind of point downwards and you you just like smack into the ground at that angle. And so time and time again, we're doing these line landings time and time again, I'm trying to smack in like, like, you know, Bo and Luke Duke. And he's getting so angry with me. And in the end, we had a freaking screaming match in the cockpit. And I just laid it out to him. Oi, I don't understand what you're saying. I just don't understand Ernie. You know, you've got to explain Anyhow, he never even explained it. I went back to the accommodation that evening. I was freaking threaders, you know. Mm. And the Austrian guy turned to me and he said, did he tell you to pull back on the stick? I'm like, what? When you come into land, you've got to ease back. I'm like, no, he didn't tell me anything. He yeah. said, and, and that was it. It was a fellow student that taught me how to land. Just by pulling back on the stick, it, you change the angle of your aircraft and the aerodynamics completely change and you suddenly go from smacking into the ground to hitting that lovely floaty cushion of air where you, you can hold the plane in that cushion of air, can't you? If you give it a little bit of throttle, it stays. Yeah, exactly, yeah, you're flaring. You're, yeah. you're doing a good solid flare. Yeah, yeah and, and, so you, and you're right, Chris. Um, the, there's a very, you obviously with any kind of uh, instructional um, process that you go through. I mean, let's take the military, for example. You know, mostly, you know, um, obviously when you were, you, you were a Marine, right? And you go through the Marines and, and obviously the Marines, the, the, the firearms instructors per se, are brilliant. They, they live and breathe firearms and they really have a, a great uh, methodology of, of drilling the soldier into handling that weapon safely working on the ranges safely and actually becoming an accomplished um, shot, as it were, you know, with the, with the weapon. And then you can eventually, you know, uh, sort of pass out as a Royal Marine. And so it's vitally important that you get points across. But the point is you get, without good instruction, we don't learn, you know, as subjects. And yeah, from my experience, um, when I went through the process of flying, I think that there were largely good instructors, um, but some were just average and there were a couple that weren't that great at all, definitely. And they don't explain things and they don't seem to have the knowledge of actually what it is to, to teach. So it does vary, I think, with instruction across the board. You know, it's probably the same for people right now that, you know, are listening in on, 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 this, uh, on this podcast. And imagine if you're learning to drive. We well, could be the same for a driving instructor in the car. 
you know, with a with a perhaps a teenager. But a good driving instructor will really explain everything from the off and the whole, you know, reason why we've got to do this and why we're doing that, and and to try to nurture that process. But you know, perhaps someone who's not so good in in, in the uh, in the car will make a bit of a hash of it, and they're not explaining properly. And so the subject, the the learner driver, is making the same mistakes over and over again. And you wonder why they need sort of 30, 40 lessons mm. to get, do you see what I'm saying? So I think, you know, the, you know it, it very much down to the quality of instruction, definitely. That, that helps an awful lot. That reminds me of something. Um, my son drove for the first time the other day, a six. <laughs> <laughs> he's six and he can drive a car on his own, right? Pretty impressive. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a bit of credit for that, you know. <laughs> I started him off on my lap. He's always driven since he's like one, you know. You Every time I watch that, Chris, like slap on the wrist for you, mate. He'll be, um, by the time he gets to his teens, he'll be twocking. You know what twocking is? Taking without consent. Yeah, taking without <laughs> the owner's consent. He'll be a twocker by the time he's about 14 years old. As long as he doesn't hurt you someone, got to in the bud, buddy. yeah. As long as he doesn't hurt anyone, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not too bothered about that. But um, yeah, he started at one. We'd get to the end of our road, and I go, "Oh, my wrist! I've hurt my bloody wrist again." And oh, I don't know how to get the car home. I'll drive, Daddy. Oh, you think you can, son? Yeah, okay. And he'd get on my, he'd get on my lap and drive. And I used to get him to put one foot on my you know, on top of, put his foot on top of my foot. As he got bigger, his foot would just sort of rest on top of mine. If I put him on right at the front of the seat and his other foot would rest on my accelerator um, at one. And I just say, right, in, we're going into first. And he'd do the gears. I'd say, feel the clutch going down. And that's it. And the other day I was like, right, you just drive. <laughs> I sat in the passenger seat and, um, I think he stalled the first time. The second time he was away, <laughs> like, it's awesome. It's um, well, kids they they but don't forget kids at that age is we underestimate them. That's probably probably the best age for learning because their mm. minds are just like little sponges and they're just soaking it all up every day. You know, yeah. so it's, it's probably a, it's probably a given that you could teach kids to drive at a very young age, but obviously they don't perhaps give give them credit <laughs> you know someone made made the decision nope they've got to be 17 years of age you know and that was obviously some authority in westminster or something back in the day you know mm. his, for his in first, america i think it's 15 right yeah it's younger there i think it depends you know, or it used to be 15 i don't yeah. know what it is now in the uk it's actually the youngest you can drive on the roads uh well, it certainly used to be this i think it was 14 if you were a farmer, you could. Okay, um, yeah, that you, makes sense. You could drive farm vehicles on the road. Um, for his first birthday, I bought him a knife. I remember that. I remember thinking, you know, start start him young, get him used to knowing what skills are. Because if you was an Inuit community, kid, you'd chuck the kids a knife to play with, you know, and they just get used to skinning stuff and whittling wood from a from a really young age, and um, so. I don't know. I'm guessing about two and a half. We probably he started sharpening sticks and stuff. And by three, I'm happy to let him sort of do it without any guidance. And um, it's good that he's out there in the in the wilderness, kind of like you know, exploring and you know, enjoying his childhood in, in the physical sense. Because I think um, you know, not that's kind of a minority with kids these days. They're all kind of glued to the. Uh, to the phone, aren't they? And the, you know, you, you can't even have a conversation with a lot of youngsters these days because they, they're not sure, you know, on the art of conversation. Um, it's, it's, perhaps there's a bit too much of that and reliance on, on tech for kids. But really, they should be doing what, what you, you know, your, your son's doing, you know, sharpening sticks and kind of out there in the wilderness, you know. Um, I, I certainly lived, a, lived a, a youth like that, and I'm sure you did sort of back in the day. We didn't have all the tech. Yeah, and you eventually progress onto a box of matches, and that's when the real fun starts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is funny. Um, I got quite, I got a bit shouty yesterday because um, 
quite often YouTube is our babysitter. I know this sounds really awful, but when you've got two people that work, you know, my work is pretty much all, my work can be 24-7. It's, it's, I have to force myself to take time off to obviously, I don't have a structure is what I'm saying. My partner also works hard and for example, this week they're building up to go away to, for holiday. So my partner doesn't want to have work over the holiday, if that makes sense. She's been doing a lot of overtime and it's meant that he's been sat there and he, I, I, I wanted him. I mean, I bought him a tablet when he was two, not because I'm a freaking idiot that, that wants Bill Gates to babysit my kid, but because I, want, I don't want him to be like me where technology is a struggle. You know, I want him to understand what code is. I want him to understand the mechanics of a computer, which wasn't explained to me until I was uh, like 27 for crying. 27 and someone sat me down and went, right, you've got like your BIOS. That's like the bit in your brain that wakes you up from sleep. Oh, okay. So then you've got your memory, which is like your brain, you know, the memory stacked, cell, cells stacked in your brain. All right, okay. And you've got your power supply. That's your energy. You know, that needs fuel. So that you plug it into the mains. And, you know, your CPU, that's your brain in the way your brain processes things and allocates power to this, to that, you know, to this muscle. And, 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 and to have it explained like that, still, that's how I understand a computer today. But to think I was 27 before I understand that. And now my son's, you know, I just wanted him to be au fait with technology as young as possible because this is the world they're going into. But it has gotten a situation where because he knows how to flick around YouTube, because it's on the big telly, isn't it? YouTube's on, your, on TV these days. That he's got into watching these junky American kids. I call them kids, but they're actually like 30-year-olds. And... It's the worst side of humanity. Well, not the absolute worst, but they go down to the departments, you know, their, their equivalent of being Q. They take out like £10,000 or something that's just abnormal, but because they're all millionaire YouTubers, that's nothing to them. They fill up their trolleys with just this absolute junk that once they've finished making this construction, which is always shit, it's always like mask and tape, <laughs> black maskers around everything. And, and, and at, by the end of the show, it's all just going down the dump, right? It's just awful. They'll set themselves a challenge to make a fort for paintballing or, or just some, something pants. And it's never done with any skill, any, you know, woodcraft or metalwork skill, or it's all just pants and, and the fact that they're 30 year olds kind of triggers me a bit <laughs> that like, Oh dudes, you're just crap. <laughs> Sorry. But it's more the point that it's this junky stuff. And I genuinely wish he had like Tarzan to watch like I did as a kid and he could fantasize about living in the jungle and, and, and swimming in, you know, underwater and catching fish and, fighting crocodiles and doing all proper man stuff, not building sissy bloody fortresses to do paintballing. <laughs> yeah, mate, I second that. I love Tarzan. The legend of Tarzan. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. When I was a kid on Saturday mornings, I'd watch me Tarzan and I was very insular as a child. I kind of did a lot of stuff on my own. There was a lot going on in our family when I was a kid and, and I'd go out of the house and I'd have my rope, my lasso, and I'd unzip my tracky top. Right, and I'd bear in my, my manly seven-year-old chest to the world. <laughs> and, I, and it's because I was Tarzan, you know? And I'd take myself down the river and I'd try and lasso things. <laughs> and and um, it's meant a lot, you know, as an adult camping out in the Amazon rainforest and, and, and standing on top of waterfalls and swimming in, you know, beautiful lagoons. That's my Tarzan dreams come 
come true, Jamie, you know? And I feel for these kids that just watch junk, crappy little... Yeah, there's uh, so much information out there and it's easy for kids to just be at home and absorbed. And I think a lot of parents, uh, they switch off, you know, with the supervision. You know, they just let them get on with it because they know they're safe. You know, they're in the they're in the lounge or the snug or whatever it is or their bedroom and they're watching, like you say, they're just untold amounts of... A lot of it's uncensored. You know, they can pretty much watch what they want. There's mm-hmm. so much on there. You wonder what, you know, let's face it, you wonder what benefit that that's going to give any any kids having complete access to to the media and, and so much uncensored sort of television in a way through through these through these platforms you know but moreover i think it's harmful too much of that every day mm. is harmful too much kind of liberty for them to to expose themselves to that they should be out and about you know it's important that they get a balance but i think it's an easy thing for parents to yeah just let them crack on in the bedroom and you know play on the tablet or the phone the sit in front of the television I mean, they don't, they don't have to supervise, you know, and, um, and yeah, they, uh, it, it's a changing world in that respect because I remember as a kid, I, I mean, I, I think I'm only slightly younger than you, but I grew up in an era when I spent most of the summer holidays out on my, on my BMX bike, you know, and um, <laughs> in the woods, you know, climbing trees, you know, building sort of swing bridges and, and rope swings and perhaps swim, swimming in the local books and, and stuff like that. But generally speaking, just loving the outdoors, cruising from A to B on the BMX. And I, I, looking back, I had, a, I had a really active childhood, great childhood, really. Um, and you're learning all about managing risks. You're learning about, you know, the social side of life, kind of cracking on with your group, with your peers, with your mates. And it's kind of building skills for life in a way, you know, skills for your, your, your adolescence going on to sort of young adulthood. Kids aren't getting that now. They're so sort of cosseted and wrapped up. And I mean, I've got a couple of young nephews myself and I see it. You know, I see how a lot of, the ch- a lot of children are and it's a very uh, sort of pink and fluffy sort of generation. And it's, it's changed a lot in, in, I, uh, I, since, what, we were, since we were kids. You've got these man kids now. And they're wandering around with their silly skinny jeans and they're fucking halfway down their ass. <laughs> I'm not blaming them, right? To me, this is all agenda. This has all been created for a reason. Didn't they come from the um, it's more sort of like the the, the black sort of uh, culture in America? I think with uh, was it prisoners or something like that? Yeah, Someone yeah. It it was is a couple of things. First off, that in 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 the kind of black communities, they would have hand me downs as I did as a kid, as I'm sure you did. You know you. You, you wore secondhand clothes as a kid very often. And when you got a hole in the elbow, your mum put a patch on it. And that was not, that was not, and I, I think I wish we could bring that back. Um, that was one reason is that you wore your brother's jeans and that's why they were halfway down your ass. And that turned into a fashion trend. Another theory or, or posit is that in prison, it can mean different things the way you wear your, your, things so if you have them worn like on your left cheek of your butt it means you swing this way if you're wearing them this way it means you you know you're up for a threesome or some i don't know but um it's this i don't know it, i'm all for disrespecting your elders if your elders are a bunch of knobs because that's been my life you know utter hatred for fucking dickheads excuse my french friends this is my inner trauma coming out but you know, i remember kicking a chair across the latin class at school when my um when the teacher wouldn't let they, was, they were going to give us um detention all for lunchtime because we hadn't done our latin probably but I had a, a letter to go uptown because I had to do something in the town and I remember she went you're not going so I went, oh, I effing am. And I just turned around and booted my chair at her. And went. Anyway, I digress. But the thing is, that, that was kind of deserved disrespect. But these days, any young person disrespects an old person because they think it's because, they, they, because they're used to doing it on a keyboard because you can write anything to anyone at any time of the day 
in any shape, way, form, fashion that you like. And there's no repercussions other than possibly the person blocking you on the social media. It's people have grown up thinking that that's normal. And also the same culture that means you can't punch people anymore. Not that I'm suggesting violence, but it, it was a good, um, someone, someone put in the comments, the word I'm looking for, but it was a good limiter, right? If I said, you know, Jamie, blah, blah, blah. It, there's a limit there that I can go that, and that you will accept where I'm not taking a piss out you, you know? There's a, there's a there's a line that if I go over that line, you're entitled to smack me one. And then I go away and go, oh, I won't be saying that again. Yeah, I was I was wrong, wasn't I? All that's been taken out now because of, you know, the cosy health and safety litigation society that that that's been created. And so you get people that fucking think they can say what they like. And it's really difficult when you've been in the forces where you still have the right, there's certain things you just don't say to people. Or if you do, you got to be prepared to go around the back and fight it out. And I think um, it's kind of allowed this, you just got like these namby pamby young men, what we call in my, in my day, namby pamby, like they're basically pussies. That wander around with their silly jeans and they not, 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 I'm not talking about all people. There's m- most young people are absolutely w- w- wonderful, kind, and it, it's nice that this element of violence has been taken out of society to, to, to a degree. But then you get this other, like, you, you, you just, you just see the like, lack of respect. And I'm not trying to say anything, AJ, <laughs> just w- waffling probably, but. Just this, you know, this whole, I mean, the internet's responsible a lot. Like when I was young, take my situation, you know, if I had someone saying something and they'd lived, worked and traveled in 85 countries across all seven continents, they'd written six best selling books. They had one of the best podcasts on the internet come through extreme mental health trauma and, 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 and addiction battles and da, 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 to, to, you know, create a dream life for themselves. I'd like to be tempted to listen to that dude. I'd kind of be like, he possibly knows stuff that I don't, but the internet culture has created this. Oh no. As long as you've got a keyboard, you fucking know as much as anyone else out there. And you, you've got, and it's um, it's not healthy, is it? No, it's um, it's definitely it's definitely a changing world. And I I would echo what you said about um, I think with an element of society, there is a distinct lack of respect, and you see it. I mean, um, you know, there's a you know, you see, you know, people kind of. I mean, I, I'm here. I'm based here in London, and you hear about it. They don't publicise it all the time, but you hear about all the kind of gang cultures and the stabbings that are going on. So, what happened to like Queensbury rules with the uh, youth falling out with each other and you know altercations nowadays? Why do they have to involve knives? That just seems ridiculous to me. You know, the good old fisticuffs and you know Queensbury rules down the park couldn't settle something. Um, but it's got to become, you know, someone's got to get weighed in and stab someone up. And literally, I mean, on that note, the true story, um, literally about, I kid you not, about four or five weeks ago now. So I was going from A to B in London and specifically I'd been out swimming in Grove Park, okay, which is slightly east of central where I'm based. And I'm in Grove Park and I had to get the bus. Ultimately, I'm trying to get up to... Um, um, Greenwich North. I needed to go up there on a bit of business, right? So if anyone knows Grove Park up to sort of the, the Greenwich area, it was actually two buses. So I had to take a bus from Grove Park to Lewisham, one of the big red London buses. When I get to Lewisham, change, and then another bus would take me up to Greenwich. Now got to Lewisham, got off the bus, and there was a bit of a wait for the next bus coming along. It was only about fifteen minutes. I didn't mind that. And then I saw in this kind of like. Um, um, shopping parade section 
um, in between, you know, all these shops, there was a butcher's there, there was, you know, green grocers and etc. And there was a kind of pedestrianised bit in Lewisham, if anyone knows it. And um, there was a bit of a congregation. I thought a lot of people there, and, and I saw a couple of blue lights in the distance. So it was a couple of hundred metres away. So I walked over and um, kind of made my way through the crowd sort of gently to see what was going on. Because it was quite quiet, but a bit of a commotion, blue lights from a couple of emergency vehicles behind. It was just a couple of police cars. And then there was about half a dozen police officers. Um, there was one police officer straddling a young man. He was about 20, he was no more than about 24 years of age. And he had, a, he'd, he'd had his shirt cut right the way through the midline and his shirt was open like his T-shirt. And the police officer was kind of straddling in him and bouncing up and down on his chest, giving him, you know, the compressions uh, for the kind of CPR process. And I just looked at this kid, bless him, laid up on his back and his face was like white. You know, there was no colour, no complexion. He was unconscious. And there was a little bit of blood kind of emanating from the kind of mid portion of his body, splayed out on the pavement. And it was obvious to me, you know, what had happened. And indeed, I just turned to one of the, the, the it looked like one of the local ladies or whatever. She's there with, with a couple of young, younger children kind of behind her. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, but what, what happened? Do you know what happened? She said, I think he got stabbed. And it was an example of what I'm talking about. And this was live. It was something that I'd seen at like four o'clock in the afternoon. The light was just starting to go down because this was like, again, sort of five weeks ago, six weeks ago. The light was just starting to go down. The day was drawing to a close. But in broad daylight, effectively, at the end of a weekday working day, someone had obviously got upset with someone else. And the result was that kid got stabbed or that young man got stabbed in the high street area of Lewisham in what's that, southeast London. And that is not only just frightening, but it's alarming. It's, it doesn't bode well for our society going forwards. And I just think you talked about a disrespect, and I echo that. But I think we've got some fundamental flaws, really. You know, there's something really wrong with the way that society is kind of going about its business and the way that, you know, young people are kind of... Uh, obviously uh, associating themselves and, 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 and dealing with one another, you know, and, and yeah. that, that shocked the hell out of me that did Chris, you know, but I mean, I'm not, but, it, but, it, but I'm not desperately surprised because of where we're at in, in 2022 and all of these problems that we, we kind of speak of, speak of, you know? Yeah. If I put my youth worker hat on, because I don't know if you know, my, my actual degrees in youth work, working with young people. I'm really, I'm really proud about that. I'm not proud about the degree. Degrees are not worth the. <laughs> Actually, no, I did. I le- you learn a lot of theory doing a degree, but then you've got to have a lot of life experience to realise that the theory you've got, some of it's f- fascinating, really valid, but a lot of it is, is to control society, to push it in a certain way, you know. But if I put my youth worker hat on, I can explain that. So um, th- there's two things going on. First, that UK has been subjected to mass immigration for years, going back to, to, uh, to Windrush. And it's um, incredibly divisive. When you take someone from a completely different culture and implant them in your own and think that nothing's, it, you know, sometimes it works, it, 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 it can work fine. But with the situation... I think this is how it is with young black men stabbing each other, which seems to be the predominant thing. I'm sure lots of young white men stab, not lots, but white men stab each other as well. Yeah, I mean, just for the record, that guy that I just described, the victim at least, I mean, I didn't get to see the incident, but the victim was actually a white, a white yeah. guy. And, uh, you know, black, white, I mean, it's, it's just tragic. Where I think it comes from, though, Jamie, is when I worked in Africa... Um, you have a different setup there. So you, you not, not every, obviously Africa is a huge continent and Egypt's very different from Mozambique where I work, but I, I worked in Mozambique and I'm, I'd say that it's probably this kind of culture 
where, <laughs> where slavery came from that was then, ex, uh, you know, people were stolen, taken to the Caribbean to work on the plantations, um, then through Windrush were transferred in, 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 into the UK. This is, Windrush is a ship, folks. And in Africa, you've got a situation where it's perfectly normal to have a father that has loads of kids with different mothers. It's part of the culture, yeah. right? And what happens is that kid grows up and you, and you say like, you know, where's your dad? He's like, oh, he's there. And he points to this guy. Oh, okay. And the next day he's like, oh, look, there's my dad. And he points to a different guy. And, and what it is, is the community just move in and look after all the youngsters if your mother die, every, every woman in your village is your auntie, essentially. This is the culture. But when you take that culture and you implant it into the UK, it doesn't work to have a young man who doesn't know who, really who his father is or his father's out, you know, it, what we'd call an absent father because it doesn't suit our, our, um, our 2.5 kids model. And I know we've got that doesn't we've got lots of divorce and that model in itself no longer fits in the UK. But but the traditional nuclear family model is you have a father smiling and a wifey, they're happy children. And did, well, you imagine you're a young black man in this country and you don't know your father because he's probably fathered several kids, right? And he's not it that culture's fine in Africa, it works, it's normal. But here it puts you as the kid in school that doesn't have a dad and doesn't have a role model and also means that you're you're severely traumatized from a from birth right you you got the trauma of like everyone else has got a freaking dad i haven't and you, you that trauma manifests as um sorry as you grow up you're then growing up in a culture where you're expected to you're you're judged on your material worth. So do you drive a Mercedes? Have you got the Rolex? Da, 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 you, you know, and these young men that are disenfranchised because they've had no support growing up, they're not going to get all that. It, they, 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 they can't even study at school. It, 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 they, they, the mind's not settled enough. They're traumatized. So this is where you see a, the, the, a lot of people turn to selling drugs. Is It's a very, it's an easy way to get from here to there which you can't do through academia because it doesn't suit you. And it doesn't suit a lot of, you know, people from all nationalities um, or all backgrounds, I should say. But when you grow up and you've got this internal pain, this internal anger, it's a bit like I was saying earlier, you get very like you're protective of yourself. And when someone challenges you, it's like how Fucking dare you, Charlie. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through in my life. You, you, and, and this is when the knife comes out. So, yeah, you're going to disrespect me. I've actually had enough disrespect in my life because I've had to grow up without a freaking dad. I can't study at school. I can't do the did it. Bang. Have some of that. This is, this is the conversation I think that's not being had. Mm. And the powers that, you know, the, 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 big money makers that they don't want you to have it. They just want you to have the confusion and for people to be blaming each other. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. mate. I think the authorities, you know, to, to a large extent, the police, uh, local government, um, you know, counselors, you know, cause obviously it's happening on their patches. I think in essence, they're just burying their heads in the sand about this kind of, uh, epidemic sort of problem that we've got with, uh, with violence in society because it's pretty bad. I mean, like I said, Queensbury rules, that's long gone and it's all knives now. And if that example I gave you about that young man getting stabbed in the high street in Lewisham, and it must have happened five minutes before I arrived in broad daylight, you know, in a busy sort of um, shopping district with a lot of footfall, you know, young ladies, young girls, um, with, with even younger children, you know, with push chairs and, 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 and buggies and all the rest of it and shopping trolleys. I think it's an absolute sin that, um, that we live in a society where this is going on like right under our noses. And the authorities, yeah, of course, they're rocking up in 
blue light services, you know, the police, the ambulances, picking up the pieces. But believe me, that's all they're doing. Um, we're not really solving the issues. We're not getting to the heart of it. Um, penalties are not strong enough. And um, it's deeply worrying, I think, for if this escalates, right, Chris, you know, if the numbers statistically, these kind of incidents start rising, and we know they're on the up, because every year they talk about the stats, right? And they hear about the number of fatal stabbings in, say, London in the survey of 2021. Well, it's alarming. I mean, it's like you look at the statistics. I don't know what it is offhand, but it's like something like 100 plus every year or something. They're official figures. They're probably the ones that, and probably several, there's probably several more unofficial stats that don't even get on the list mm. that, we, that we don't really hear about. But it's really alarming how much, you know, um, fatal violence is actually going on out there in society, largely amongst um, the youth of today. I mean, what does that say about our society as a whole? What does that say about our leadership? And like I said, I think the authorities in general are just burying them, burying their heads in the sand, quite frankly. And it's not being dealt with in, in, the, in, 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 in the way that it truly needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Exactly, and it and it is set to get worse. And it also, um, I mean, white ethnic Britons, we're we're set to become the mon- minority here. If you look at the, uh, you know, the 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 family setup, how many children people have, we we've all gone down the line of well, we used to have three kids, but now then we had two point four. Then well, then we have now it's quite normal to have one child and and financially that all kind of like works as well with the wife going out to work and da 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 you know the wife going out to work thing was to um take the female out of the traditional family role under the guise the fake phony guise of feminism but the intention really is to break up the nuclear family children have come down so you don't have four children anymore you don't have three you don't have two you possibly just have the a lot of people just have the one um, having children later as well is another offshoot of women going out to work. And so what that's done is meant the traditional British family, you know, our, 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 um, we, we, our numbers are going down, but to, but to have this mass immigration that we're experiencing is much of it illegal. And it's all, it's all by design. It's coming from cultures where, no, no, no I have six kids. No, well, it, what, you're going to, what, like I can come to England, I don't have to work, and you, like, give me a house, and you pay me money, and, like, then you pay for my, you know, this, this, is, this is what, albeit well-meaning people don't understand, Jamie, you know, and, and it is, it's, it's, it's chaos. It's chaos by design, and, and it is set to get worse. And um, I think so, Chris. I think affordability is really a key issue here as well in terms of whether people can even afford legitimately to have a family. And, um, and I mean that just purely financially, you know, to do things kind of as they should and work uh, and have a reasonable quality of life, pay the bills, nurture and raise the kids. The, the, the general affordability is... is, is being pinched more and more and more. I mean, we've just seen with the new kind of, or the increased um, cost of living is going up rapidly. You know, food price, food prices, sorry, petrol at the pumps, um, energy bills at home, families' purses are being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And, you know, so it's getting harder and harder for people to legitimately choose to have children and raise a family. And so for many, the alternative is to, you know, not work um, and um, and just fall by the wayside. And, well, and, 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 have, let's, and, and have sort of state benefits to support them. Yeah, well, let's not forget, Jamie. They're trying to usher in this this credit system, aren't they? And and in China, they already have it. So they want. I mean, it's going to be put to us under the guise again of being something that's all beneficial for us all, as they they all do with such kind of like security. Um, measures but essentially it could look great to say well look there's a bottom income there that i you know even if i don't work i'm ill or i just don't don't bloody want to work frankly i'm going to get this from the government every month 
be paid to me digit digitally via some chip technology. Um, it it's it's frightening with this increase of poverty because price of everything's going up. People no yeah. longer can buy houses. Everyone has to rent. No, it's just creating this massive uh, impoverished community that yeah. are going to see something like social credit and think, oh, actually, you know, that's that's you know not a bad thing. At least I can take home a thousand pound a month. You're, you're da, right. da, 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 da. And then when it becomes under the condition of, oh yeah, but to get your thousand pounds, you can't be a member of any affiliated groups that, for example, could be seen as questioning this narrative or going against the fact checkers, you know, and this, this is your, this is your, this is what we were warned about. Um, this is what we, we've been warned about and this is exactly what's happening. So we maybe become more of a dictatorship, you know, yes. that's, that's pro <clears throat> possible concern. Well, th well, think of it. We, did you ever think in your lifetime you'd be placed under house arrest for two years for pretty much, you know, you'd be told, Jamie, you can't travel anymore, mate. Sorry. Oh, if you do this, you can, but Chris can't. No. Sorry. I do find that. And it's kind of ironic and odd that COVID in the media doesn't even get a mention today. Have you seen it being mentioned recently? They're, they're barely talking about it. It's, it is odd. A couple of things that I noted, like just yesterday, listening to the radio, um, I think the average house price is push, pushing up to 282000 they blurted out on, 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 on some, some uh, fact piece yesterday in terms of the, uh, the kind of analysis on the housing market. I mean, that's ridiculous. 282000 What sort of first-timers in life can, can, uh, can generate that kind of uh, mm. liquid cash? Or, or not necessarily the cash, but even be able to afford a deposit on that, let alone the mortgage, let's satisfy the, the loan criteria to get a mortgage from the bank. It's just outrageous. And um, because of the, also I meant, wanted to mention the increased cost of living, um, they reckon, they estimate that an extra 2 million people are going to be pushed into the poverty line. You know, they're going to be pushed below that sort of poverty line, so to speak. So, um, that, 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 that's just crazy. Meaning that they're going to be that extra 2 million people are effectively then going to be living hand to mouth, mm. um, because they're just not going to be able to afford anything else once they've paid sort of food, the energy bills, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's a real concern because if you think about it, 2 million people in terms of those of that are actually working in the country, because remember a lot of elderly, a lot of young, a lot of perhaps sick, disabled, infirm, they can't work. Mm -hmm. Let's say for argument's sake, there's something like 40 million workers in this country, 2 million people being pushed into the poverty line because of recent increase in the cost of living represents about 5% of our current working um, demographic and the people that can work and pay taxes and then obviously contribute back to the system. Mm. And it's just crazy that... Um, that, that that number of people are, are getting driven into, into poverty because of recent, you know, um, inflationary rises in, across the UK, you know, because it's gone way beyond. I mean, inflation is normally about 2% a year, roughly, but we're being hit by, and in some cases, I think businesses are being hit by, you know, an increase of like 120% on energy bills. It's stuff like that, you know. It's like how, how can a lot of businesses are going to the wall? Yeah. And where do they go? Where does that trade go? It all goes up, doesn't it? It all goes to these bloody oligarchical mafia types. And, we, and it's not just the financial poverty. Um, I've got to be careful what I say here, Jamie, because the platforms that we, we um, put our videos on. But when you start messing with people's DNA, it don't end well, <laughs> right? That's all I'm going to say, folks. I think some of you get what I'm saying. Um, it don't end well because we're built like we're built a, um, a specific way under Mother Nature for a reason. So it's not just financial poverty; it's health. We're going to be we're going to see a massive increase in health health issues at the same time as we got a dumbing down of education. You've got fact checkers, which 
mean that you're not getting the full picture. You're only getting a slice of it. So I don't care if people tell me a whole load of horse shit. I, I like to listen to it all and it helps me build the jigsaw and then work out the narrative. Um, but that's mental impoverishment. You know, it's thought impoverishment, thought control. Uh, you know, you can, you can go on. It's this junky, crappy video, social media culture that we've created. It's, it's stifling people's journey to enlightenment. So people aren't getting what's known as self-actualization. They're not fulfilling their complete selves. They're being kept in this dumbed down world. So imagine, imagine now you've got these masses that are all like dumbed down. They're all the bodies of failings that the answer to that is big pharmaceutical companies who go, right, you take this every day and you have these pills for this and we'll give you this injection for this and these pills, for, you know, and, 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 and at the same time, they can't work and they're on credit from the state. They're not allowed to think because if they think the chip that they've got in their wrist or in their card or wherever the hell they're going to put, that gets turned off and, and it will, you know, look how travel's been turned off for people that don't want to go with the recent narrative, you know? So actually, I never thought it would affect my life, but the marathon of the sands, I've, I've had to wait three years. I s still don't know if I'm going to be able to, you know, paid my 5,000 pounds, still don't know if I can run that race. Um, what, you think they're not going to do that when they've got the microchip bloody uh, credit system? Of course they are. It's going to be right. You have to toe the line with this way of thinking. Um Mate, it's all happening. It almost sounds like quite exciting if it wasn't so freaking mental. <laughs> yes. Back, Jamie, let's just finish off here because I've loved this. I wish all my podcasts could be like this. We just, I guess we've just got to roll with it, Chris, though. You know, change is inevitable in this, in this life, in this world for all of us. And all we can do is embrace, you know, you know we, we're expected to trust our leaders and our politicians and government. And so, you know, we're expected to, like I say, emphasis on the on, on that word. But um, who knows? We've got to tr somehow, you know, just roll with it and 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 live the, the best the best lives that we can, the best versions of ourselves going forwards. If we want to try and get on, yes, we've got to meditate more, folks. Get in touch with, I call it the universe. Call it what you like, God. There's a there's a big picture going on here, and it's um, it's only when you get quiet that the answers come to you and, and the universe speaks to you and, and then you stop listening to the David Camerons and the Tony Blairs of this world and you realise that they're just idiots. And Boris Johnson, look, I mean, look at the picture of unhealth that our country's leader is. You know, the guys on his liquid lunches or whatever, that, they're so morally wrong to have someone whose body is physically toxically poisoned leading the country. Because when when you're toxic, you you don't you don't well you don't vibrate at the right resonance that your human body is supposed to. So you're not in the ecosystem as you should be. So then you become slave to your animalistic self, and you start to knock back the red wine, and you do the cocaine, and you want to buy fast cars because you get stuck in your ego, and da da da. And that's what we've got. That's what our leaders are. That's, that's all of them. <laughs> but, Jamie, I, I wanted to get back to the flying just to say, let's finish off by talking about our first solo because that, that's quite something, is it? When, it, when your instructor goes, there you go, there's the plane. You haven't passed your test yet, but you're good enough to fly it on your own. And they let a bloody idiot ex-Marine, right, <laughs> who's a danger on the roads, have a whole aeroplane to go and fly up there with bloody 747s and, <laughs> and parachutists coming in and skydivers flying across your, across your path. And uh, what, what was your solo moment like? Yeah, no, it was, it was a, it was a lovely moment. It was a, it was a good day. The weather was pretty good from what I recall, blue skies, a few puffy clouds up there, but pretty stable conditions, um, very light winds. And um, yeah, I mean, I went, you know, I can't deny that I had a little bit of nerves going on at the start of it, thinking, okay, can I pull this off? But then, you know, you, your mind thinks back to all of the, uh, the the positive flights you've made up until that moment and the, and the sort of the, the uh, 
the, the, the positive, you know, the gentle sort of successful landings. And you think, yeah, I can do this. I definitely can do this. I've had enough uh, sort of build up and preparation. So you've got to check yourself. You've got to get your mind right. And then, yeah, being on that threshold that we described earlier, you know, that threshold for the start of the active runway. Once you get that clearance in the, in the headset from air traffic control, um, you are clear for takeoff. It's a great moment. And then you, you remember, Chris, you know, full throttle down the runway, sort of nose on the center line. And then I'm looking for like 55 knots thereabouts. And it's sort of vibrating on sort of 55 knots and then gently pull back on that stick. And then you can feel the lift, you know, the wind under the uh, under the uh, the wings themselves, and the elevation, the lift from from below. You describe that cushion of air, and you're getting that lift from the forward momentum, and the lift, and you're you're going up, up, up. You're ascending, and and I was hitting about what about thousand feet indicated, so about one thousand feet above the ground, and then coming around in the pattern, and just working around in that pattern, sort of gently. Um, and then it's a you know the and then the the uh, the rush of uh, sort of final approach eventually and coming into land um, and then descending 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 sort of checking altimeter but more crucially checking visually and because this was VFR flight of course so visual flight rules so looking forwards looking left looking right and sort of making sure there's uh, making sure there's no issue with sort of hazards obstacles and you've got a clean run in towards the active sort of landing point on the runway. And it's a lovely feeling when you're eventually coming in and that last moment, as you described earlier, you know, that all important flare and controlling the, uh, the airspeeds, you know, um, crucially and, and, and sort of uh, accordingly and then touching down. And then that realization that, yeah, first solo, you've done it. You've sort of hit the deck sort of unscathed and, um, You've, you've pulled something off that uh, was was a you know in my case it was a um, a childhood ambition it, it was a lovely feeling definitely a lovely feeling and I just remember so sort of then um, more or less taxiing back in straight away um, getting back to the apron parking up hopping out of the aircraft and uh, you know, sort of more or less high fiving the instructor and a couple of other onlookers uh, probably fellow students at the time. And you feel, you know, that real sort of jubilation. You feel elated about what you've just done. Yeah, and it was the start of the journey for me, you know, kind of going forwards. Um, so, yeah, lo lovely moment. And just to sort of take you, take you through that first solo. Yeah, I have uh, some great memories of my time in Florida. And, um, and I was very lucky, actually, very blessed and fortunate. Some years later, I did go on and um, uh, won a scholarship to fly a hot air balloon and I did that training in Italy so that was something quite different slightly different medium of flight entirely but to go solo with a balloon as well was an amazing feeling in a oh. similar vein to light aircraft but you'd have to come back on the show when we just talk about that I'd be fascinated and yeah, um, I mean, flight is an amazing thing and, uh, and a bad thing happened to me granted in, in uh, August 2007 with, with a burns injury but, but, but um, it doesn't detract from, in my mind, that, um, you know, flight in general is an amazing thing. We take it for granted. I mean, we all fly away on holiday from time to time, you know, or have done in the past. Um, and we do take it for granted, but it is an amazing um, sort of concept that we can get on an aircraft and, and get around. And, and, yeah, I mean, long may we have that sort of luxury in life. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something that I'm always excited about, even to this day, you know, getting on, getting on a plane and, and, and jetting off somewhere in the world. Mm. Did they, um, I've got to go in a minute because I've got to go and pick a certain young person up from school, but did they cut the back of your shirt out when you flew solo for the first time? No, no. Are, you, fam are you familiar with it? No, I wasn't familiar with that. It wasn't anything quite so dramatic probably just had a brew at oh. the location more or less, and then probably went out for a beer that night. I, I um, went back to the flight school. They promptly got a pair of scissors. <laughs> they say, don't wear your best t-shirt. I uh, think I only had the ones I took traveling anyway. And, and um, they cut the back of your shirt out. Friends don't ask me why it's just what it's, it was. 
I don't even know if it was tradition at just that flight school. I'm guessing it's not because it's kind of a, seems quite a, I don't know, would be a bit of a random thing. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's when you flew solo, not when you passed your test. When you flew solo, you cut your, um, the back of your shirt out. And um, when you passed your test, you had to go into the cafeteria at the flight school or uh, at the airport. And um, someone would announce, friends, we've all got a new pilot in the community and everyone would give you a round of applause. Uh, good stuff, mate, isn't it? Yeah, good memories, uh, mate. So, and, sorry, mate, go on. No, no I was just going to say, you know, it's, a, it's just a real blessing to have had that life experience, really, looking back. And um, unfortunately, it's not something that I really get to do much these days. Um, but, uh, yeah, like beautiful life experience and um you know it sort of uh it certainly makes you think about um you know what what, what we have in the world and and, and uh and what opportunities are, are that, that that uh that we've got in front of us you know exactly so friends at home uh life on a thread jamie's book available out there now paperback hardback audio get on it. It's going to be the next book I listen to. I'm really looking forward to it because I, I feel really rude, mate, that I haven't read it yet, but you, I'm sure you appreciate it. Oh, you it. must, mate. I think you'd really enjoy it because mm. it's not just the flying stuff. It's, um, there's a whole load of stuff about my sort of earlier life and youth and a lot about the army and my, my, my um, you know, my uh, escapades coming through the process and eventually getting to kind of UK special forces. But, you know, it's, um, um, I think there's a, there's a few nuggets in there for everybody. I think even, even, even women would get something out of this, you know, mm. um, because of the way that it's been kind of been written up, it's not a guns blazing sort of macho story by any standards. And I hope that um, people, many people right across the board would take away something from, from the narrative of life on a thread. So yeah, please uh, tune in if you get a chance. Yeah. And I, I can add to that, Jamie, because I, when I went in a bookshop in Hong Kong, as the city's, second best-selling author I was at the time. The girl in the bookshop went, ah. She said, for every man that buys your book, it's five women buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was re that's like a dream come true for me because I didn't want to write something. I'm guessing you were like an Asian girl's pinup. Well, there, it, it, to be honest, it wouldn't <laughs> have been, it would have been expats, expat women that were buying it, not not, um, I don't think the Asians are probably too interested in, a, in an ink. Well, I, I mean, obviously I can't. What, one thing was nice is I had people say, I had Cantonese people contact me to congratulate me on my Cantonese to say you um, uh, uh, how good it was, which is, I mean, it wasn't. I, would, I, I, could, cool. I could barely get by and I couldn't sort of understand the TV if you know what I meant. meant. But, um, but yeah, that's that's the thing, isn't it? Uh, guys like us, we're not out to write a macho book. We're out to tell our stories and 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 hope that people can get something from it that enhances their life. And yeah, and and interestingly, Chris, I think you and I have got quite a lot in common in terms of life experience. We've both got, I would suggest, it's not a boast, but we've both got like an extraordinary kind of above average um, level of life experience to, to speak of. And people can learn a little bit from from that, you know, with our stories respectively. Um, and it definitely isn't a boast from where I'm coming from. But um, I, you know, like you, I've been around the world in, in a major sense. You know, I've travelled far and wide, and a, a lot of life less learned a lot of life lessons along the way. Um, it's not something that a lot of young people are have the luxury of so much because we were held back a lot during the pan pandemic. And you say travel was massively restricted for a couple of years. But, you know, we have generally, genuinely rather been out and kind of, you know, done a few things and kind of bought the T-shirts. And, um, and uh, if, this, if, our kind of, if our kind of stories can uh, resonate and, and help a few people along the way, then I'm, I'm all for that. that. That's what it's all about. Most definitely. And I hope our conversation today, folks, has... Um it's been a chat. This isn't so much a pod. I'm not here. To, a lot of people call these interviews and it's... I, I started my podcast. I wanted to chat with people, you know, and like you would if you're in the naffy bar or something. And I hope from our chat today, friends, that um, 
it's helped put some stuff into p- perspective for you. And uh, Jamie, massive thank you again, brother. Friends at home, much love to you all. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you soon. Cheers, Chris. Cheers, brother.